right, we're live everybody. So this is Monday's class for my grade 11 applied math students. And this is the last lesson we're going to do in chapter 5, Z-scores part 2. So Friday, we learned how to use a Z-score, which is just a distance away from a, a standard deviation, right? Just a distance away from a mean. We used the Z-score to figure out, well, what percent of the data is that? Right, we had Madeline and what was the other person's name? Madeline and Sarah comparing their grades when they're from two different schools. Who had the biggest percent of students at their school that they beat? So that was what we used Z scores for on Friday. Today we do the opposite. What if I know what percent I want to get? What score is that? So when you want to determine a particular value when you're given the percentage, above a certain z-score of data. You must be given the mean and standard deviation. You must be given the percentage as a decimal. Remember, we don't really work with percents in math. So this is the opposite of what we did in the last, uh, last lesson. So here's our first example. And on the calculator, we'll do the calculator first for you TI people and those people who have the TI app. It's called inverse norm. Now here's the one problem with, and Desmos is the same way, the one problem with this is it actually only works for the left side of the data. You'll see what I mean in a second here. The mean lifespan of a non-stick frying pan is two years with a standard deviation of 0.5 years. Miss Bednarski wishes to replace her frying pan after 65% of its natural life. After how long should she replace her frying pan? Assume the lifespans of frying pans are normally distributed. You might be thinking, well, Miss Bednarski sounds like a really interesting person if, if she's sitting around with a, like a chart on her wall in her kitchen going, oh, time to replace that frying pan. But let's, let's extrapolate this to something more in the real world. What if the Miss Bednarski in this question is in charge of a chain of restaurants? She's the supply manager for all of the Boston pizzas in Western Canada. What happens when their electric frying pan that they use to saute something? breaks down. That can't happen. That can't happen in the middle of the dinner rush. They have to have stuff that's going to work all the time. So they would have a regular cycle to replace things. They might be going, well, this thing's not broken yet. Yeah, but we know statistically it's going to go any time now. So the person in charge of replacing stuff because they know it eventually breaks down, it's kind of like your computer. It's not a matter of if your hard drive's going to crash. It's when. They're all finite things that will die someday. Same with nonstick frying pans. Actually, nonstick frying pans, we go through those pretty fast, right? You start to clean it, and then you start noticing scratches, and then the nonstick coating stuff starts to come off. And you're not supposed to eat that stuff. I believe it's not good for you. So you throw the thing out. So the mean lifespan of a nonstick frying pan is two years. You throw it out before it starts to get gross, right? All right, how do we do this question? Well, the first thing I think I would do with this question is I like having a little sketch just to organize my data and my information. So on my sketch, the mean is two years and the standard deviation is 0.5. So that makes this 2.5, 3, 3.5. And as you can see, very, very few of the frying pans, if I did let them live that long, would last past 3.5 years under constant use. So this is 1.5, 1.5. And we had a great conversation a couple classes ago about, well, how can this data go on forever, right? I mean, who's taller than Yao Ming? Does that mean eventually there's a 0.00000001% chance that somebody will be born who grows to be 20 feet tall? Well, physically impossible, no. Statistically possible. Same with this data here. Obviously, obviously one more standard deviation is as far as this could go, and then I hit zero. In other words, I bought the pan and it already is broken took it out of the box and it was a piece of junk and it didn't work. Okay, so obviously there can be physical limitations to that whole infinity idea. But anyway, on to the problem. What am I doing? I am trying to find out when she should replace it. I want to replace it when I've hit 65% of its lifespan. Remember, this represents 50% of its lifespan. This is another 34%, 15 and 34 is too big, 84%. So it's gonna be somewhere around here, isn't it? Somewhere around here is the Z-score that I want. How do I find it? Because that's gonna be something like 65% right there, right? 
Okay, well, I find it on the TI by hitting inverse norm. So I'm going to show you how to do that on the TI first. So guys with TIs, okay, uh, I like to kind of do the, the usual stuff that we did the other day. Let's clear off anything else that might be in the way. Like, is there any stat plots on? No. Are there any equations hiding around that I was, was I graphing some algebra on this thing? No. Is there an old drawing? Because remember, there's, not, there's kind of a difference on these things between graphing and drawing, which I kind of had to remember yesterday. Remember that was kind of, or Friday, that was kind of painful. I forgot from two years ago how to do this. To erase any old drawings that might be there, you go second function draw and number one, clear all drawings. And there we go. Okay, so we're ready to go. Um, okay, if I wanted to just get the number, I don't want to look, I don't want to see my calculator make this graph. All I do is I do inverse norm. So here, let me move that over. And of course, now it doesn't want to move to where I want it to. There. So I want it to do inverse norm. So hit second function, distribution, and then number three is inverse norm. And the three numbers I want are area, mean, and standard deviation. The area has to be entered as a decimal, so 0 0.65, because that's the percent of the data. Remember, the percent of the data is the area. So 65% is my area, comma, and what was my mean again? My mean is 2, and my standard deviation was 0 0.5. And you can enter 0 0.5 or just 0 0.5. I like entering the 0. Close my bracket and hit enter, and this number here is 2.19. So here, I'll write it down again. So I hit inverse norm, and then I use my three numbers that I need. The area, which was 65%, 0.65, the mean, which was 2, and the standard deviation, which was 0.5, and it spit out 2.19. Now, if you want to see this graph, you need this number. It can't graph it and give you the answer at the same time. But once you have this answer, if you'd like to make this graph, no problem. Let's make this graph. So if you need the graph, you go back to what we were doing last time, and you use shade norm. And let's see. So shade norm. Remember, shade norm is the four, the four number summary. Lower boundary upper boundary, mean standard deviation. So what's the lower boundary? Well, this goes, I know you're thinking, you're thinking, well, it bounds at zero. Physically, it bounds at zero. You can't have a frying pan that you bought that broke before you bought it. So I guess we have to say physically at zero. But the graph doesn't behave like there's a physical limitation. The graph goes forever. So my lower boundary is negative 1 times 10 to the 99, right? That's, that's our calculator's way of saying infinity. Smallest number it can handle. A negative 1 with 99 zeros on it. The upper boundary we just found is 2.19. Now, on my calculator, that number had a whole bunch of decimals on it, and I don't feel like repeating those decimals. So you know what I'm going to use? We've seen this trick before. We'll use our answer button. Because just don't touch anything else in the calculator. Don't, don't make another calculation. And my answer button should be that. Comma, and then mean, and then standard deviation. Now, this will only graph it for us if our window is set to see it. So before we even punch this, what kind of a window do we want? So what kind of window do we want? What is our, um, let's see, let's go to the calculator. Okay, so let's go to the calculator. What kind of a window would give me this graph? Look at the graph. Again, it's really handy to have a sketch. So I think I'm going to say, you know what? Um, again, zero seems to make the most sense because that's, that's as far as it can go. Five, it goes to 3.5 here, so five should be plenty. We'll count by 0.5s because that's the reasonable scale. I always tend to set my scale to be the same as my standard deviation, right? Because that's what the graph's counting in. It's counting in 0.5, so that's a good scale. Now, for y minimum, I don't put, I never need negatives, but I always put a little bit of negative at the bottom, just so that when the answers come up, when the numbers come up, it doesn't cut off the bottom of my graph. So I give myself a little bit of negative 0.1 of room, 
my y maximum of one, remember this whole area here is 100%, so one seems reasonable for a, a height. If this is too high, I can go back and change it. Okay, and, and I'm pretty good. I, I like this scale. This is a good scale. Well, scale, actually. The y scale could be something smaller, like, I don't know, 0.1 or something. There we go. There's my, there's my window. So my window is going to be x min is 0, x max is 5, x scale is whatever the standard deviation is, which is 0.5. My y minimum, I just put a negative, just a negative something, just so that I can have some room at the bottom of the graph to read numbers. And then my y maximum, I just used 1. I might end up changing my mind on that. And my y scale... I just counted by point ones. Good enough. That should show me the graph. Now, do you remember how to do shade norm from last class? Shade norm, you go to second function, distribution, but you're drawing, and you shade norm, and then again, you need the four numbers for shade norm. The four numbers are left boundary, which is negative infinity, my answer, second function, answer, right? Second function, answer, answer is the negative button on this calculator. Two and 0.5. Close my brackets and hit enter. And there's pretty much the same picture that I have right there. Yep, just a little past half. And I know that my answer is correct if the area is the same as the area that they gave me. So this is a nice way to double check your answer too, right? 65% was the number we started with and that's the area of the graph. Again, this whole second part with the shade norm is only if you need to see a graph. If all it wants is the numbers, you were done when you finished this. All right, what if we're doing this on Desmos? Desmos people, oh, hold on a sec. Let me just pause my video here. Sorry about that, we're back. Okay, so on Desmos, everything we just did actually is probably less complicated on Desmos. So we go to, let's open a Desmos. Oh, I don't have a Desmos open. I thought I did. I must have accidentally closed it last class. So there we go. There's Desmos. And okay, so what we're going to do is we have to use the normal distribution feature just to make a normal distribution graph. So in this case, the normal distribution is uh, a mean of 2 and a standard deviation of 0.5. So let's put that in. So a normal distribution, which we can find, you can type in normal dist, or you can just go to functions and go to distributions and normal distributions, and then you can make it look pretty. There we go. And you type in the two numbers. 2, comma, 0 0.5. And again, you might want to center that, zoom fit that, and it makes it look good. Now, we want to find how much area there is under here. If we click this, it finds the whole area, 100%, from negative infinity to infinity. Now, we want to know when this probability is 65%. We can actually guess and check. You could actually kind of say, well, is it when we hit, uh, say, 2 point, I know it's after 2, is it 2.1? Oh, close, and then you can just keep playing with it, 2.2, closer, but I actually, you know, I'm actually over it now, so it's, it's smaller than 2.2, but bigger than 2.1, but that's kind of a drag. You can guess and check it, but there is a more technical way to do it. So click off of here, let's just put that back to the default setting, which was infinity. And here's how you do it. You type in, or you, you go to the function menu, and you go to inverse, under distribution, inverse CDF. Remember CDF stands for cumulative distribution function. So the inverse cumulative distribution function. Now, it wants us, it opens a bracket, it wants a list of data. Well, I don't have a list of data. Well, actually I do, it's this graph. This graph is my data. So here's, now this might be tough on your phone. On your phone you might have to just type this, but this graph is the data. So copy it, 
No, hang on. I'm going to have to use control. So control C. Did that work? Control C. And put it in here. Control V. There. That's the data list. The other, the graph of the normal distribution with a standard deviation of 0.5 and a mean of 2 is my data. Feel, if you can't figure out how to cut and paste that and copy it on your phone, you can just type it. And it's easy to type because you can just look above and say, oh, I'm just typing this. Normal dist, open a bracket, 2 comma 0 0.05. Then put a comma after that. And now I want the percentage of 0 0.5. Six, five. And there we go. There's our answer, 2.19. That's how you do it. It's actually less buttons to punch. So the last part was I put, I, I picked up from the top here, I went to inverse CDF, and then it opens a bracket and it wants two things. It wants two numbers. It, the first number it wants is what data set are we dealing with? Well, I don't have a name for this data set, so it's normal distribution, like that. And then put a comma after that, and then type in the percentage that I want. By the way, I think actually I can make this a slightly, slightly less complicated. Am I, can I do this? Does A, if A equals that, and then I put an A here. Does this work? I haven't tried this before. It does work. Haha. -ha. Check that out. Call this A and then put A comma 0.65. Here's something else you can do, by the way. Just like when I do the drawing on the calculator, it kind of checks my answer. I can put this number in for here, and then this should, this should show me 65% of the data. So let's try that. Again, you want to know a nice quick way to do that? Why don't I call this, uh, call this uh, I was going to say A for area, but I already used the letter A. Call this B or something. There we go. B equals that, and then for the maximum, put in B. You could type in 2.19266, but eh, that's a lot of typing when I can just call it B. And there we go, 65%. Okay, how did I do that? Okay, I'll start from scratch again. Ready? Okay, starting from scratch. Starting from home. What does this question want? It wants a normal distribution. Function, normal distribution of 2 and 0 0.5. Make that pretty by zoom fitting it. Boom. I would like to know how much area there is, or sorry, what the number is to get to the area of 65%. So again, the easiest way to do this is to call this, say, A or something, A for area. Oops need to hit a negative button there. And then from there, go to functions, inverse cumulative function. So inverse CDF. And then the, it wants two things. It wants an A, it wants to know the data set, which in this case is A. And then it wants to know what percent we want to count to. We count to 0 0.65% and it ends up being 2.9. And if we want to do a double check to see if that, that looks right, that gives us 65%, just call this something else. You can call it X or something if you like. I'll call, call it N, it doesn't matter. And then put that N in here for the maximum data. And there you go. That's how you work these kinds of questions. Okay, let's do another one. So that was the first one. Example, a manufacturer produces cell phones. They have determined that a mean of 24 months is needed before their cell phones need to be repaired with a standard deviation of six months. How many months should the manufacturer, manufacturer set their warranty so that less than 10% of all cell phones produced will need repairs during the warranty period? Okay, so I want, again, I like a sketch. Here's my lovely freehand bell curve. Oh, that's not too bad. I don't mind that for freehand. I'll take that. <laughs> okay, so now on here, we just found out that it has a mean of 26 months. 
before it starts needing repairs. I think I've told you this story with my Huawei phone, right? It worked great for the first couple years I had it, and then it started breaking down, it's starting doing weird things. I think this Christmas I'm in for a new phone. It started doing weird things right when our government arrested their CEO. I, I, I can't, it, I'm not a conspiracy guy, but that just doesn't feel like it's a coincidence. Anyway, 26 months with a standard deviation of six. So, okay, one standard deviation away would give 32. Two standard deviations away will be plus six is 38. Three standard deviations away would be 44. Somebody double check my mental math. I'm trying to skip count by sixes. I've never been good at skip counting. And then down here is 20. Six before that would be 14, and six before that would be eight. And then there we go. Now, if you're the company, you don't want to offer a warranty that's so soon that you'll end up having to pay for lots of phones getting fixed. You kind of want to know when is the massive majority of phones going to need fixing, and then set your warranty so that it ends just before that. That is how you do business in this world. People are laughing here, but that's, that's how they think, right? You design something so that it breaks after the warranty's over so that it's your customer's problem, not yours. So if I know that 10% of all my cell phones are what I don't want to pay for, think about it this way. See this eight? Okay, what was the percents again? This is 34. This was 13.5. This was 2.35. This is 0.15. 0.15% of my cell phones will need fixing after eight months. 0.15 plus 3.15. What's 0.15 plus 3.15? Do you remember how to add? What is that? 2.35. So that's 2.5. So up to here, 2.5% of all the cell phones I sell will need repairs. I want to keep this going until there's only 10% left. But remember, these things, these functions on my calculator and computer count from the left. So think about it. If this is just scrap calculation, you don't need this. If I want less than 10% of phones to need repairs, it means I want 90% of the phones to still work. So in other words, this yellow line is counting, this yellow area is counting how many of the phones are still working without problems. So up to here was what? We just said that was 2.5%. 2.5% plus another 13.5%. That's 16%. Plus 34, that's 50%. Plus another, another 34, that's 80%. Ah, somewhere in here will be 90%, won't it? So somewhere in here will be the line where 90% of my phones are still working, but this 10% here, I'll write that in words, 90% still work, but this 10% need fixing. That's where I want my warranty, right around that line. So, I had to convert the 10% to 90%. Does everybody get where those numbers come from? Together, they have to add up to 100%, right? All the phones. So, I need to find the Z-score for 90%. Okay? So, let's find it. Let's do Desmos first this time. Okay, Desmos, let's clear everybody. Let's just reset. There we go. So starting from scratch. All right, so for Desmos, we want a normal distribution. So show my keypad function. You can just type normal distribution, but I just, I click better than I type. Make that so I can see it. Looking good. 
And let's see, what was our, our data for this one? The mean is 26, and the standard deviation was 6. And of course, you can't see it anymore because the graph moved over, so there that moves it back. It might be a smart idea to call this a set of data, so I'll call it data set A. And then data set A is this normal distribution. I would like to know how much, how far into that distribution do I have to go to get to 90%. So I'm gonna go functions, inverse CDF, and the, the data set is data set A, comma, and I'm looking for 90%, which of course you have to record as 0.9. Oh, yeah, 0.9, there we go. And it turns out, that it's 33.68. And again, if I want to see that on the graph, call it a different number if you like. Call it, call it, uh, call it N or something, or B or something. And then up here, say that your maximum is B. And there we have it. There is 90% of the data up to the number 33.69. So I'll go back and I'll put that as my answer. So that number there is 33.69. Okay, you wanna see that with the calculator now? Okay, calculator people. Well, this is the number that gets you to 90%, 33.69, right in here someplace. Okay, calculator people. Calculator people. Okay, again, turn this on, clear that. Clear all that, clear my last drawing, draw, clear drawing, done. Okay, I don't know that I need a drawing, I mean I have a nice drawing here, so again, I'm just gonna enter my, my numbers, right? So on, on the TI, it's going to be inverse norm, and then I need three numbers. I need the area that I want, I need the, um, st the mean, and I need the standard deviation. And that's all you actually need for this. It's actually fairly uncomplicated. The harder part is when you wanna see the graph. But if you don't need to see the graph, all you need is this. So second function, vars, inverse norm is number three, and 0 0.9 comma 26 comma six. Close my bracket, hit equals, and there's the same number that we got before, 33.69. Okay, again, if you want to see that, think about how big the window has to be for this. I would say, okay, well, my X maximum goes from zero, now it goes higher, so zero to maybe 45 or something this time, 46 maybe, and my scale for X, this time I should count by, what was the standard deviation again, by sixes, so count by sixes, uh, my Y minimum is good, my Y maximum is good. Go back, okay, my window's set, so now go back to here. And this time, if I want to see my graph, I have to do a shade norm. So, shade norm, that's under draw, shade norm. And remember, shade norm is four numbers from negative infinity, and that's as close as my calculator can get to negative infinity, comma, to the upper boundary, which is the last answer that I just typed, which will be this 33 point whatever, and then mean and standard deviation. It was 26 and six, right? Close brackets and hit enter, and you better draw for me. Or I'll be really unhappy with you. Oops, okay. <laughs> I guess I need a better window. I think, I think one is way too high for this one, so that's fixable, but it got the area I wanted. Can you see that? The area is 0.9, which is 90%. But if I want the window better, I'll just, I'll change the window to, I guess one is, one for Y max is a little bit too much for this. So change that to, oh, I don't know, 0.25 maybe, because it was way down there. Now, it won't, if you hit graph, it won't go back to the graph, because technically we didn't make a graph, we made a drawing. So go back to the screen where you calculated and just hit enter again, and it'll redraw it this time with a much taller, well, even 0.25 is kind of low, but you get the idea, it looks pretty much like that. There is the yellow part, and the white, the clear, is the green part. And that's 90% of the data. Okay, now, what do you do with this answer? 
Remember, it said, how many months should the manufacturer set their warranty now? On the one hand, most warranties are rounded to the nearest year, right? So if you're rounded to the nearest year, you could say, therefore, what's 33 or 34 close to? Set the warranty. Oops, and I just misspelled warranty. I put an L in the word warranty for some reason. Set the warranty to 30, well, 36 months is three years. So three years. But now you could argue, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That would be too far over. I'll have to fix more phones that way. So why don't we just say we'll set the warranty to 33 months? That way we're actually on this side of the line. We err on the side of profit. 33-month warranty. There we go. And there are actual laws about stuff like this for things that are expensive, like cell phones and cars and stuff like that. They're not, there is lemon laws out there where they are told, hey, you have to provide a warranty so that, you know, that 90% is like the minimum number of people who should need repairs before your car starts breaking down on them. Okay, so I have two questions. First one over here. I'll go back. You know what? We're going to do one more example. So we'll do one more example in, on Desmos, and then I can come back to this one if you like. Yep. Okay, I'm going. Okay, we'll do the we'll do the Desmos one first this, again this time. So the next example is, and this one is exactly like the way that universities would have to think. The mean grade point average. You know the GPA means grade point average. The mean grade point average at Fort Richmond Collegiate is 2.6 with a standard deviation of 0.5. If only the top 10% of students are eligible to receive scholarships to the University of Manitoba, what is the minimum GPA required for a scholarship? So, okay, once again, I'm going to draw a standard normal curve near... Oh, that one, that one's... This one's got kind of a tumor on it or something. So let's go up and try to make it down. Ah, that'll do. This one's a little pointier than my last one. And so here we go. Here's my mean is 2.6. And my standard deviation is 0.5. So over here would be 3.1. And over here would be 3.6. And over here would be 4.1. And over here would be 4.6. And then, of course, the next one would end the data because I think a 5.0 is perfect, right? That'd be 100% as your grade point average in all your courses. Good for you. I don't know how you'd manage that, but there we go. Okay, hang on. I'll have to dig that later. Okay, so, I just threw, oops, oh, undo, undo, undo. I'll just draw it again. I was just trying to erase the end here. So this, this would be where it ends, right? At 5.0, there's nothing after that. Okay, and then, obviously, my grade point average can go down, too, so down by 0.5s. So this would be 2.1. That would be 1.6. That would be 1.1. We're getting into some pretty dire students here. And then this would be 0 0.6. And then, of course, before that would be 0 0.1. And then before that would be 0. And I would hope nobody with a GPA of 0 is trying to get into university. Question? Yeah. OK, so there's, there's where our data is. We only want the top 10%. So this is actually the same problem we had for the last problem. So that means if you want to accept the top 10%, when you're doing these calculations, the graphs only, inverse norm only works from the left to the right. So you have to think of it as you reject the bottom 90%. So that means that we, again, want the 90% range someplace. So we know that, again, that's going to be somewhere between the second and third um, standard deviations from the norm, right? So somewhere, somewhere past there. There is 90% of the data, I think, or is it somewhere between the second and the third? I think so. Or is it between the first and the second? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay, so um, what do I do? All right, so Desmos, let's start from scratch. So just reset. 
So we got a, just a blank graph. We want a normal distribution. Distribution, go away. Normal distribution, go away, I says. I'm going to use the keyboard so that doesn't happen. A normal distribution with a standard deviation uh, and a mean. So the mean is 2.6, so I'm going to type in 2.6, 2.6. And the standard deviation of 0.5. There. And then make that pretty by hitting fit. So there is my, my curve. I am going to call that something. I'm going to call that data set A. That makes life easier by calling it something. Now I need to find the inverse CDF of data set A with an area of 90%. And there we go. The answer is 3.24. And if we want to double check that, call this something else, call it again B or something. You want to check that? Find the graph if you graph up to a maximum of the value at B. And yep, it's 90% of the data. So 90% of the students at FRC, according to the data, would be below 3.24 for a GPA. Okay? All right, let's do it one more time on the TI. On the TI, again, clear everything. Set, draw, clear the drawing, clear the drawing. And go back to here, clear all that. And then, okay, so how is we're going to do it? We're going to do... Second function vars. Um, I'm not seeing it on yours. I'll get to you in a minute. Number three, inverse norm. Again, area goes first, 90%. Your mean of, uh, or sorry, yeah, your mean of 2.6, your standard deviation of 0 0.5. Close the bracket and hit enter, and there's the number, 3.24. If you want to see the graph, you think about what size your window has to be. And again, that diagram we made is really helpful for that. You know you want to go from 0 to 5. That's supposed to be 5.0, not 50. That's supposed to be a decimal, not a highlight. There we go, 5.0. So if we want to see the graph, we go to our window, and we go from, say, 0 to 5. And we count in a scale of 0.5s, because that's our standard deviation. And the y maximum, this y maximum is probably too low this time. Let's, let's try it at point, say, I don't know, three quarters of the way up the screen. 0.75, that works. Well, if it's too high we'll, or too low, we can play with it later. And then go back to the calculation screen and calculate a shade norm. Second function, bars. Draw a shade norm. And again, now we have to go from negative infinity comma, to my upper boundary, which is the answer I just had, 3.24, second function answer, comma, and then my mean is 2.6, comma, my standard deviation is 0 0.5, close the bracket, and it should draw this picture for us. Oh, I actually didn't go high enough, but you get the idea. Perfect. Lovely. Okay, so that's how you do these examples. I've got some guys who have some questions here, so I'll go back. People at home, you can always just rewind the video. Um, oh, I guess I should write the final answer for this. So the final answer is that the GPA required... Now, what was our number again? We ended up with 3 point... I've already forgotten the number. 3.24. Oh, so I, was, so I actually shaded too far over. So let me get rid of this, some of the shading here. Ooh, geez, I got rid, of, got rid of all my shading. There we go. So 3.24. So it should be kind of just in there someplace. Do, 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 So this number here is, oops, this number here is 3.24. Now, everything up to 3.24 is 90% of the data. So the GPA required, I might round down, because I don't want to include more than 10%. I mean, there's only so many scholarships to go around here. So I, I, I kind of want to round down so that I don't include the 3.23 people. So, I mean, GPAs only ever rounded to one decimal place, right? So rounded to one decimal place, 
round, actually, I'm, I'm actually thinking, sorry, I have to round up, not down, right? Round up, because I don't want to include the 3.23 people, right? So round up to 3.3. Now, I know you're thinking, you're thinking, but 3.24 doesn't round up that way. But I wouldn't want to include more than 10%, right? I want the top 10% not the top 10 point something percent. I'm happier with the top nine point something percent. So I think the GPA required should be 3.3. All right, I'm gonna end the video there. If anybody has any questions, they can always go back.